Okay, so people will start jumping into the session. Just going to watch for one person that we need to bring into the panelists. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We have our experts from the health unit joining us today, in addition to Chris King from the Quinny Manu well, QEDC and Quinny Manufacturers Association, and Suzanne Andrews from the Quinny West Chamber, and Leslie Lavender from the Prince Edward County Chamber. And we have Jillian and Teresa up there in the corner. Uh, we are recording the session, so um, hopefully you'll be able to look listen to it later if you don't catch all the answers. Just waiting for Andrew to show up. He's not there yet, uh, Roberto, so we'll just hold on. Um, the, we do have a Q&A enabled, so please place any questions that you have there. And we also have the upvote button enabled. So if you see a question that looks like what you'd like to ask, rather than having to type it all out, you can just click on it and it will upvote it and raise it up the list. So we'll be taking care of those as we go through. Um, I know that Jillian and Teresa have a bit of a PowerPoint. Roberto is going to answer some questions and I'll just keep watching for Andrew, but I, Chris, if you want to welcome any of your component to this session, please go ahead. Thank you, Jill. Um, from Quinney Economic Development's perspective, we do we provide a lot of support to the Quinney Manufacturing Association. And we had a steering committee last meeting last week, and a lot of the manufacturing employers at the time were talking about some of the changing rules and regulations, and we're looking for more clarity in terms of you know, if I have a employee with symptoms or if they were in close contact or a family member was in close contact and what about vaccinated versus unvaccinated workers and wait times and, and there was concerns and there was disagreements with employees about should they be returning to work already or should they be at home and some employees want to come or come back early and some want to stay a little extra uh, late away from work but just a lot of uncertainty and it was great to see the uh, you know in partnership with the chambers the health unit Kind of taking those concerns and and uh, providing this presentation to give some clarity to our employers not only in the manufacturing sector but across the whole board about what they need to do so uh, we're we're thrilled to partner with the chambers and uh and we're glad our manufacturers are are going to get some new information to uh to help them keep everyone safe thank you All right, well, why don't, uh, Roberto, do you want to start or do we want to pass it over to Jillian and Teresa? Well, I can go first, uh, just a quick introduction and uh, to begin by saying that we're very happy to be back. It's been a few months since we've done one of these sessions and we uh, thank you again for the invite. Uh, I'll start off with a brief overview of the current situation, the provincial picture, uh, where we are with case management and the regulations and I'll pass it off to uh, to uh, Jillian and Teresa, who will talk more specifically about uh, how workplaces can navigate the um, the uh, the fun uh, 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 realm of uh, case management and, and and determining who should be monitoring, who should be isolating. So, starting with the with the local picture, uh, the local situation as of uh, two days ago, January 26th, locally we have 535 active cases. We consider these high-risk cases because our CCM approach has changed. Uh, so these are cases that our um, uh, staff and, uh, and, uh, and residents of various uh, facilities in our area. I'll talk a bit more about that. Um, as well, we have 19 uh, active outbreaks. Uh, in the past, we've talked about outbreaks, uh, meaning in, in a generic workplace being two cases or more that are epi-linked. Uh, but in, in, in the current situation, we are looking in, in when it comes to long term care and other facilities, I think one case uh, in that facility. So all of these 19 outbreaks that I'm referring to currently are in places like long term care homes, retirement homes, group homes, hospitals, etc. Uh, in terms of our local picture for vaccination, we are currently uh, 132,000 doses. Uh, 312, which equates to 80% of uh, fully vaccinated. Ontario is still using the double dose as the fully vaccinated. Some provinces are moving to a third dose, I think, with Quebec being perhaps the first. But right now, to be considered fully vaccinated, you just require two doses. Uh, the provincial picture is, uh, is um, 
as, uh, as follows. Uh, yesterday, uh, sorry, two days ago, there was 5,368 cases, new cases. Uh, we have to take these with a grain of salt because the testing strategy has changed from uh, a broad approach to a more tailored uh, approach. Not everybody can get a test uh, at the moment. Uh, there was 4,000 individuals hospitalized due to COVID-19 in the province with 68, uh, sorry, uh, 608 of those uh, being in ICU. Uh, and as you probably heard on the news, the uh, ICU capacity is, uh, uh, is, uh, is rising. I think um, at the height of, of the second wave, we had 900 people in ICU. Uh, now we have 608. Um, I'll move on into our CCM direction. I think I touched on this briefly, but uh, in late December of last year, we had the direction from the ministry that uh, public health units were to focus on high risk settings, uh, what I call vulnerable settings uh, to protect vulnerable people and the staff working there. So as of, uh, of that date and reinforced again on January 13th with a new document, public health units are to focus on staff and residents of, of uh, those settings leaving, uh, uh, I guess, perhaps other workplaces wondering how to uh, navigate through case management. So today's session, which is what we call train to trainer in the public health uh, milieu is to increase uh, knowledge amongst uh, workplaces that we are no longer providing uh, CCM support directly with case management, uh, the tools necessary. And this is one of perhaps many uh, few sessions that we can do to uh, increase that uh, knowledge. So as of um, January 13th, based on the latest guidance, our uh, communicable disease investigators will respond to cases uh, locally that are in those high risk settings. The other cases, um, and sorry, and, and within that high risk setting category, uh, under 18 uh, persons are also considered high risk. The other cases go to a provincial agency called the provincial workforce, and they call uh, people in our area from a uh, central location in Toronto and follow up. But that follow up sometimes is a couple of days delayed. So what usually happens is the employer learns from the employee that they've had a rapid test, a positive rapid test, or they have symptoms, and that's where the situation evolves from. So there is some guidance in the documents. The uh, January 13th, uh, there's a, some flow charts that workplaces can follow to determine who should be self-isolating and for how long, or whether they should be self-monitoring. When it comes to the uh, provincial picture for regulations, we are until Monday still in modified step two. As of Monday, some restrictions will be uh, relaxed and that, those restrictions will stay in place until uh, February 21st, at which time there's gonna be further re, uh, relaxation of the restrictions. And then March 14th, I think is the target. Uh, and I use the word target because all of these dates are targets, as you may recall in the fall, uh, the government had uh, provided us with a nice uh, infographic of those of that roadmap, but some dates and some restrictions have been adjusted. So that's where we are. Um, if there's any questions about uh, any of that that I just covered, I should, uh, before I forget, mention that there's some questions that came in through the chambers uh, about uh, some of the contents of the new regulations. The working from home requirement, for example, doesn't appear to be uh, there as of Monday. So when we move to the new regulation, which is uh, us going back to step three in the process, the remote working from home is not a requirement um, uh, uh, as of Monday for uh, businesses and organizations. Uh, you may, as a business and organization, still decide to follow that if you feel that you can still operate uh, and, and you feel there's an extra safety measure by having people working remotely, but it's not a requirement in the regulations. Okay, I think that's it. Uh, I don't want to take too much time uh, on this overview because I think the uh, the bulk of the presentation is around the, uh, the material that uh, Jillian and Teresa, our youngest and brightest public health inspectors in our unit, will cover. And I guess at the end we can do a Q and A um, on on what they present, and then as well as my brief overview. Are we muted? That works. Good. Thanks, Roberto. So um, the next um, few slides, um, we're going to just, we've been asked to do a quick recap of the current requirements and restrictions. We're not going to go into too much detail. Obviously, the regulation is changing uh, 
uh, end of day on Sunday, taking effect January 31st. So we just thought we'd put a recap of um, those general workplace requirements that are still in place and still likely to continue to be in place for some time in most workplaces. Um, and then um, just some links to um, where to find resources on these different topics. So this presentation will be available after the fact uh, and will include the links that you can go back to. So we won't spend too much time on that. I know Roberto and Andrew have already covered the general requirements. Um, and then we'll briefly mention which section 22 class orders are still in place. Uh, and then Jillian's gonna um, cover off the current self-isolation requirements, um, include a few scenarios, um, frequently asked type of questions, and then uh, we'll just open the floor to Q&A at that point. So um, uh, still a, a common question is, where do I go to find the current information? Because information is changing so rapidly, um, we're, we tend to refer businesses to this landing page on the uh, provincial website. If you're wondering where the current regulation is, you go to Ontario.ca. And at the very top there below coronavirus in Ontario, there is a link uh, that takes you to the next page. Um, next slide. And the, um, this, this slide covers all the public health measures and advice that are currently in, in place. So it's a, you, you just kind of have to know how to read this page. So the current information is at the top. And as you scroll down through this past the gathering and events, it takes you to what is coming up down the pipeline. So anything that the province has announced and the dates where they take effect is there. And um, until we see the regulation, this is really all we have to go on as well. So as of, uh, you know, just prior to this meeting, we have not seen the updated regulation uh, that takes effect on the 31st again. So this is where we'll be going to the, uh, this website and the ELAWS website will post the current regulation once it is available. Um, and uh, so January 31st, February 21st and March 14th are those forward looking dates. Um, and we'll all be staying tuned for those updates. Um, just going back to the foundation of uh, contact tracing and um, your you know, duties, obligations as an employer uh, in Ontario, the Occupational Health and Safety Act sets the foundation for preventing illness in the workplace and ensuring that there are control measures in place uh, to uh, address any of those risks. You have to identify and, and put in mitigation strategies to address risks, including COVID. Um, and then the Employment Standards Act covers um, a number of uh, minimum standards for employment, including the job protected leaves and such. Um, and so both of those regulations, or those acts rather, are uh, enforced by the Ministry of uh, Labor, Training and Skills, Skills Development. Um, and then the Reopening of Ontario Act, uh, the, uh, or, or ROA, as it's uh, commonly referred to right now, what's in, play, in force is Ontario Regulation 263.20. We're expecting it to go back to Regulation 364.20 um, on January 31st, but we will see. Um, and so, like I mentioned, the next few slides will just cover the general compliance measures, but the way these regulations are framed is typically there's a schedule that covers general compliance, then there's a section that covers the sector specific rules, um, and uh, then the events and gatherings uh, limitations are covered in another schedule. So you need to know which sector you are and have a look through those once they um, go live on Monday. Next slide. Okay, and enforcement as well. Just um, back to the previous slide, the Re Reopening Ontario Act is, is uh, enforced by basically any um, provincial offenses officer, so public health inspectors, police, bylaw enforcement, and uh, many of you may already be aware of that. So the general compliance measures um, still in place. Um, we put an asterisk beside those that have been um, a bit more challenging for businesses and uh, we've noticed uh, more violations or um, uh, challenging uh, challenges in complying with uh, screening, face coverings and masks and on the next page, um, uh, safety plan. So some opportunities there maybe to relook at uh, these areas um, 
and how you're applying them in your business. Uh, we've included links there to the active screening of workers. Um, the workplace screening tool has actually, the province is in, in um, the process of updating that. So the gener generic screening tool is now expected to be used. So you'll see if you haven't already, you should click on that link, go to that. It'll cover off all the current questions uh, screening questions you need to be actively asking your staff members each day before they present for work and make sure you keep those records for 30 days. Um, in some cases, patrons may need uh, to, uh, patron records may need to be kept, but likely that is changing next week based on the yesterday's announcement. Uh, passive screening as well is required, so signage, etc. So again, just click on that. Uh, it, everything's hyperlinked uh, when you see the blue. So when you go back to the PowerPoint after the fact, it's there if you don't know where to find it. Um, of course, face coverings, universal requirement in any indoor place. Uh, that's uh, basically it's accessible to the public. Personal protective equipment is still required. Um, when uh, uh, you know eye covering it is that added layer of protection when you're working within two meters of somebody else who's not able to wear a mask for whatever reason that may be. Uh, lineups, of course, um, make sure uh, those are controlled to prevent um, congregating outside and ensure that two meters distance is being kept. So these things we expect are going to be staying for some time. Safety plans as well likely are gonna be um, uh, staying. So preparing, implementing, and posting that um, in a conspicuous area of your business and making it available on request. Um, there's specific requirements and specific uh, questions that need to be asked. Um, I'll just reflect that in the next slide and cover that in a little more detail. Obviously, eating and drinking at work, physical distancing or barrier is required indoors. Uh, any time that uh, face coverings are removed to eat or drink. So keeping your staff safe by keeping them physically separated when they're eating or drinking. And then uh, cleaning and disinfecting, it's really as often as needed to keep a sanitary state and um, use only approved cleaners and disinfectants. Make sure um, the main things are making sure you have products that are labeled, you're, you're using them per the label instructions for use. And they are in fact, approved um, for the control of viruses. So you wanna look for that virucidal claim on the uh, label and use the concentration that's needed for disinfectant claim. Um, and then of course, uh, proof of vaccination is staying. Um, if uh, you know it's a, a requirement for screening uh, uh, for entry, then the QR codes um, are now required as well. So there's an app for that and uh, to be downloaded where uh, basically you can put it on any phone or any kind of device. You scan the individual's, um, the individual's vaccination, uh, uh, proof of vaccination, and it's, it ensures that it's, it's uh, current, accurate, and um, you know, it'll, you're not keeping a record of that. It's, it's um, just uh, making sure you do that check, so. All right, and so just recapping the safety plans, uh, I think there's this is an opportunity still. Um, quite often, they um, you know have been looked at many months ago, and so regulations have have changed many times. So anytime the regulation changes, that is a, a great time to uh, review your your safety plan against the current requirements and update it accordingly. Um, and make sure that you're covering those specific topics that are, are need to, to be covered in your uh, industry sector. So um, most, I think most businesses are aware that the province created a, um, a guide to developing your plans. Uh, there is now a workplace safety plan builder that you can use. Um, it's great, whether you're a large business or a small business, if you have complex operations, um, it helps you create um, individual safety plans for say you want to hold a special event that's unique to you. It will go through all the questions um, that apply to you and it'll help you generate um, what you need to be doing and, and making it helps make sure you're thinking through all the questions to be asked. Um, for those of you who prefer kind of the good old Word document, there's still some uh, Word document tools there. 
um, and a checklist to make sure that uh, if you're customizing your, your own plan that uh, you're covering all the bases there as well. Um, and sample safety plans uh, for various workplace sectors are available through the Workplace Safety Prevention Service, uh, which is kind of an arm, arm's length branch of the Ministry of Labor and Training Skills Development. So there's some great tools out there uh, for you to be using if you're not already aware of them. Okay, and so another um, another great resource is our health units website. So right now, because the call volumes are quite high still, and there's a very high focus on our vaccination and our resources are being directed to those uh, important activities, um, we do encourage a uh, review of our website first. Um, if you're looking for answers to your questions, most of the answers will be there. We cover um, proof of vaccination, workplace policies. So this, when you go to the health units landing page, this box, this COVID-19 resources for businesses, organizations, and facilities, that is the, the tile you wanna look for and click on. And that will take you to all the workplace resources that are, are um, uh, available through signage um, and any additional guidance and, and documents are linked on that page. So as you scroll down, um, you'll, you'll always see that pop up as well the first time you go to our, our main health unit page. So that will tell you if there's been any major updates. Um, our, our comms group uh, tends to do that when, when, say, a regulation has changed or we're doing something new. Um, so it's worthwhile paying attention to that first pop up before you just you close it. So. All right. Um, so we've had some questions about the class orders. Uh, we do recognize that uh, some of these uh, do, do need to be updated. Those with the asterisks here are either, um, you know, have been reviewed and or are pending approval. Um, agricultural workers, for example, if you're a farm operator, you can expect that our class order will be updated. Uh, typically that's in time for the uh, springtime arrivals. Um, the employer obligations, there is a, a class order still, and, and basically that is um, links back to um, the requirement for uh, what you need to be doing when a uh, worker reports COVID symptoms to you. In addition to the other regulations that we already uh, mentioned that provide the foundation for that, uh, contact tracing to be done, um, and the self-isolation requirements as well. Um, the self-isolation order is still effect, although the approach we're taking now functionally and practically is the uh, self-isolation timelines are being updated. So the, uh, it used to be a seven days and 14 day requirement. Now it's five day, uh, 10 day self-isolation, depending on your vaccination status. But otherwise the self-isolation requirements still are covered under a class order that remains in place. Okay, some common questions we do get. Um, am I, uh, for re relating to the exclusion of sick workers from the workplace? Uh, first is, am, as an employer, am I legally required to send ill employees home and conduct contact tracing? And so we say the answer is yes. Um, as mentioned, you're required to protect your workers and the public from COVID-19. Um, and the measures that you need to take must also be outlined in your written COVID safety plan. So uh, the regulation, whether it's 263, 364, both of them refer to the safety plan and the expectation there is to outline specific measures you're gonna take to protect the workplace. And that does include contact tracing, um, when a staff member um, uh, reports illness. Um, and then you can look back again to the Reopening Ontario Act, Occupational Safety um, Act, uh, Occupational Health and Safety Act, and then our Section 22 class order. Um, so they all provide the foundation supporting uh, the legal requirement to, uh, to do your contact tracing um, following uh, notification of a sick employee. Uh, next question is, am I allowed to ask employees for their personal or medical information? So I know it seems um, a little bit uh, can be uncomfortable or not, you know, typical to be asking about vaccination status in general workplaces. 
uh, the higher risk settings uh, is, is much more common. But, but yes, the answer is yes, employers um, do often collect personal information and confidential information for employees. Um, personal health details are often needed for return to work purposes. And ultimately, that information simply becomes part of the worker's confidential health record, or, and uh, sorry, the confidential HR or human resources record in a general workplace. If uh, information uh, relating to, um, you know, personal private confidential information should be treated as such uh, by the workplace. Um, but we did have our, our own privacy officer did uh, attend a session about this a couple months ago, and it was clarified that information collected um, for the purpose of, of in the workplace and pr protecting, um, uh, preventing spread of illness in the workplace, it is when it's collected by the employer, it's not being used for health care. So it's not information that's covered under PHIPAA. Okay, so, or the, uh, the privacy of health information, it doesn't apply in that, in that sense, just simply becomes part of the human resources record. Um, and then excluding sick workers from the workplace, um, do I need to report ill employees to anyone? And the answer is yes. Um, so there's a number of considerations here. First of all, um, if we go back to the requirement to notify any high-risk contacts of their exposure so they can self-monitor for symptoms and or self-isolate if um, warranted based on vaccination status or the exposure. And Jillian will cover that in more detail in the next uh, several slides. Um, Ministry of Labor must also be notified of cases or outbreaks uh, when transmission occurs in the workplace. Uh, there is a phone number that you can call uh, and uh, there's an email where you, um, a website where you can report that directly to Ministry of Labor. Um, their follow-up, uh, where um, it, they would follow up if, if as needed on their side, the health unit doesn't get involved in that. It's a workplace safety uh, requirement. And then the Workplace Safety Insurance Board also needs to be notified of any illnesses that are required within the workplace. And the requirement is within four days of you becoming aware of that. So once the employee uh, informs you, that they've had an illness and the like, likelihood of them getting it in the workplace is very high, then the WSIB should be notified or must be notified um, under the current legislation. Um, and then we also just say, um, it, it, you may have additional reporting requirements depending on your industry sector. The one example here, if uh, like a local farm worker, uh, farm farmers um, would need to report uh, workplace acquired illness or outbreaks to Service Canada uh, relating to any of the temporary foreign workers that they have um, on staff. So, um, uh, so we may not be, you may be more well aware of what your reporting requirements are based on your sector, but that is just one example. Okay, so we're going to spend the next few minutes talking about um, COVID-19 and contact tracing and self-isolation requirements. Uh, we do very much appreciate that sometimes reading these guidance documents is like trying to solve a calculus equation, so we relate there. Um, so I'm going to try my best to explain it to you in a user-friendly format. So in terms of talking about a COVID-19 case in your workplace, we're defining that for this situation as an individual who has either tested positive, so that could be a PCR test where they go down to the local hospital or assessment center, or it could be on a rapid antigen test that they do at home or in your workplace. The other individual that we would call a case of COVID-19 is an individual that has COVID-19 symptoms. Sure, at this point, everyone's quite familiar with those symptoms, cough, fever, shortness of breath, runny nose, headache, there's a whole list. Um, so in that situation, because the variant is so common in the community right now, we are treating symptomatic individuals as cases. So when I refer to a case, this is what I'm talking about, somebody who's either ill with symptoms or somebody who's tested positive. And the guidance that we're talking about for this situation is general public or your workplace. It does not apply to 
high risk settings like hospitals, long term care homes and retirement homes. They have a different set of guidance. OK, so the current guidance document that we have came out on January 13th. Um, it's got a very long title, COVID-19 Integrated Testing and Case Contact and Outbreak Management Interim Guidance, Omicron Surge. Um, the key with this guidance is that it is for surge. So it's in place right now while we're experiencing a large wave of community cases. Um, it will be updated at some point as we start to come down from that wave to reflect new changes about what's happening at the community level. I don't have a date for that, but I expect shortly, sooner rather than later, I would imagine. Um, but for today and probably for Monday, as we head into the next week, this is what you're gonna be dealing with. So we'll go through the points that apply. So when we're talking about our cases, so our symptomatic individuals and our positive tests, if they are fully vaccinated, and Roberto did define that earlier, so two doses, and it's been more than 14 days since they received those two doses, um, or if they're a child under the age of 12, they are required to isolate for five days from their symptom onset date. So that's when they're sick, they're isolating for five days, um, and that their symptom onset day is day zero. So the day they become sick is day zero. Day one is the next day. So it's five full days. And then individuals who are 12 years of age or older, and they're not fully vaccinated, or they're immunocompromised, which um, I, they'll have to assess that and notify you of that situation if that's the individual. Um, and there is a list of um, medical conditions and medical treatments that would qualify as immunocompromised in the guidance document if, if you want to look at it. It's basically any condition or treatment that suppresses their immune system and makes them likely longer to recover from a COVID-19 infection. Those individuals isolate for 10 days from their symptom onset because it's likely going to take them longer to recover. So those are the two that you need to remember when assessing when these sick people can return to the workplace. They're either going to be returning on day six or on day 11, depending on their vaccine status. And household members who live with ill individuals or individuals who test positive are also required to self-isolate for the same duration of time as the case. Okay, this flow chart, I know it's really small on the screen. Some people might find it useful. It is in the guidance document I just referred to. Um, I like flow charts. So for me, I would print this off and put it in my office. If somebody calls you and says, I have these symptoms, you can quickly go through and assess what direction you should be giving them. Um, the other recommendation for this, if you're more, um, techie and you like the computer would be to go to the screening tool that Teresa referred to earlier for active screening and just go through the questions with the employee over the phone when they're calling in the morning to report that they're sick and they can't come to work. And the computer will spit out for you, depending on what you input, a response as to what they should be doing and what direction you should tell them. So I would favorite that. Um, active screening link if I were you. But basically this is telling you just what I went through. If you're symptomatic and you're fully vaccinated, you isolate for five days. If you're not fully vaccinated, you isolate for 10 days. And if your symptoms do not match any of the symptoms listed on this flow chart, and they'll be listed on the screening tool online as well, then it's likely that you don't have a COVID-19 infection. And in that case, you would need to isolate until your 24 hours symptoms improving before you return to work. Okay, so what do I do if my employee is a case? So you're gonna, first of all, you're gonna talk to the employee and figure out based on the information that I just showed you what their return to work date is. 
The other thing based on when their symptoms started is you're going to figure out when they were contagious to other people. So you want to see who else at your workplace could have potentially been affected by this ill person. So a person with COVID-19 is contagious typically 48 hours before their symptoms start. So two full days. So if you trace back those 48 hours, you wanna see were they at work during that time? Is the workplace affected? If yes, then you would need to assess each other employee that this individual could have worked with, attended meetings with, or had a lunch or break with and any patron that they could have interacted with or provided service to during that period as part of your risk assessment. Um, depending on the level of interaction and time spent together, it will depend on the contacts level of risk. So high risk contacts. So how do I know whether somebody who's been in contact with my sick employee is a high risk contact. So they're the most likely of developing a COVID-19 infection. So we're using the 15 minute rule. So any face-to-face -face contact closer than two meters that add up to 15 minutes. So it could be 15 minutes at one time or 15 minutes in shorter intervals. But that 15 minute rule is what we're looking at. And that includes people, even if they're wearing a mask, that 15 minutes still applies. And any face-to-face -face visit or physical contact. So any touching is considered high risk, handshaking, hugging, or any care that was provided, they're a high risk contact. Um, but basically any time where the two people or one of the two people is not wearing a mask, um, and they're within two meters of each other, they would be high risk. So if they had lunch together and they were not distanced, they would be high risk. If they went out for a smoke break together and they were not distanced, they would be high risk. Um, received or provided any care with, so this gets back to the physical touching or they, um, they helped them do something and they were in really close contact, like they carried something together or um, in that situation, they would need to be wearing full PPE. So a medical mask and eye protection in order not to be considered um, high risk. So that would be for any length of time of like direct physical contact, they would need to be wearing properly a medical mask and eye protection, or they would be high risk. Um, and this information is found directly on our website. Um, it is under notification of high risk exposure to COVID-19. If you go under, I've had a high risk exposure. This is the first thing that pops up and it will give you these steps so you don't need to memorize them. Okay, so how do I notify high risk contacts when I, I've identified who they are? Uh, my best recommendation is to send them to our website or give them a, a link to the website and all the information is there, HPE, public health, notification of high risk contacts, exposure to COVID-19. Um, this is the easiest and let them read what content applies directly to their situation. Um, but I am going to go through it quickly here to give you an idea. So again, there's a flow chart for this. Um, so does the co-person who is positive that you interacted with or symptomatic, do they live with you? So if they don't live with you and you've had contact at work, let's say as an example, um, are they fully vaccinated? So your next question. So if they are fully vaccinated, our guidance is that they self-monitor for symptoms for 10 days from the day of their exposure. Okay, so self-monitoring is the same thing you do when you screen yourself to come to work every day. Do I have any symptoms? Has my health changed at all that day? Um, that's essentially what self-monitoring is. If they notice any changes in their health, then they would follow the flow chart for people who have symptoms and would self-isolate, okay? So they are allowed to attend work if they're fully vaccinated and they do not have any symptoms. Uh, for people who are not fully vaccinated and have had a high risk exposure, 
they are required to self-isolate for 10 days from their exposure. So they are at a higher risk of developing COVID-19. So that's why they're staying away from work and at home for 10 days. So the big difference here with the high-risk contacts is vaccination status. If the symptomatic person lives in the same household as the individual, um, as the contact or your employee, then the household needs to self-isolate for the same amount of time as the symptomatic person. So if they're vaccinated, then the whole household's isolating for five days. And if they're not vaccinated, then the whole household's isolating for 10 days. So it's the same duration as the person who's sick. Okay, and this is a, just a quick recap slide. So when somebody is positive for COVID-19 or they're symptomatic, you as an employer need to conduct a risk assessment, determine if they were at work while they were in their infectious period, so 48 hours before they became sick, um, and identify anybody who might be high risk. So after you do that, then you need to notify all these high risk people. So whichever way you choose to do it, phone call, email, let them know they've had a COVID-19 exposure. And depending on their vaccination status, they'll have to follow the website direction regarding isolation. Um, and then of course, as Teresa spoke about reporting to Ministry of Labor or WSIB as required for positive cases. And then manage the return to work for either high-risk contacts or for the employee who is ill. So whatever isolation guidance they follow, whether they're vaccinated and return on day six or they're non-vaccinated and return on day 11, you'll need to note that so they're not trying to return early. Um, and then also with the return to work and clearance from isolation, they do need to be free of a fever and their symptoms need to be resolving for 24 hours. So improving, nothing new or worsening. Um, and that's going to be kind of an anecdotal situation, you know, oh, I had a really congested runny nose before and now it's just slightly drippy. So it's improving. Um, and then they can return to work as long as they've served the correct period of time in their self-isolation. Okay, let's go through a few scenarios with this information. So this is a workplace. Uh, Sally calls into work and says she cannot come in for her shift because her daughter woke up with a runny nose and a cough. So we know right away runny nose and cough are symptoms of COVID-19. And Sally says she is fully vaccinated and does not have any symptoms herself. She wants to know if she can come to work today. So what do you tell her? So no, she must self-isolate for five days with her ill household member before returning to work. So anytime somebody in the household is sick, the entire household needs to isolate. So she would isolate for the same amount of time as her daughter based on the symptom, the day the symptoms started. So five days after the day the symptoms started. So on day six, she can come back to work. But two days later, Sally calls again and says she now has a cough. So now Sally is deemed to be a case of COVID-19 herself. So she needs to have her own isolation period now. So now we flip over to the flow chart for the symptomatic individuals. And she isolates for five days from her symptom onset date. So it would be extended for another two days past what her daughter's isolation is. And then once she's done her full five days and her symptoms are improving, she can return to work. All right, let's do another one. So we have a fully vaccinated family of four individuals. Dad sc fails screening to come to work because he has new symptoms. Mom tested positive for COVID last year. It was about six months ago, she says. So 
Unfortunately, mom's test, positive test was too long ago. We have new variants since that was um, a positive test. So that in this situation, that information is not relevant. The advice for this household is that the entire family, because they're vaccinated, needs to self-isolate for five days from the symptom onset, for dad's symptom onset. And then if nobody else in the house develops any symptoms themselves, everybody in the household can return to work or school on day six as long as they are fever free and their symptoms have been resolving for 24 hours. Okay, and then the same family again. So now mom is sick. She also works at your workplace and she comes into work. She's been coming into work now that she served her isolation period, returned to regular activity, and fails screening on day three after she's just come back to work from her isolation. Now what? So likely there's been either a new exposure to mom or one of the household members, or it's the same exposure and now someone new is symptomatic. So they're, they're reinfected again. So the entire family now needs to self-isolate again for five full days, okay? So this is an, a brand new situation. They served their isolation time already for the previous situation. And now this is a new in, incident. So they're starting again. So it's five full days. Um, so they all stay home, self-isolate for five days from the day mom started her symptoms. And then on day six, if they're fever free and symptoms are resolving for 24 hours, they can return to work. Okay. Uh, one more. So we have a non vaccinated family now. The son, who's 12, tests positive. So all family members are required to isolate for 10 full days because they're not vaccinated. Okay, if nobody else becomes ill, they isolate for their 10 full days. And on day 11, if they're feeling well, they can return to work or school. That's the easy way. But as we know, households have the highest rate of transmission, which is why we want everybody to stay home. So same family, but dad starts to feel sick on day four of the family self-isolation. And he has access to testing, so he tests positive. Okay, good news is he was isolating while he was infectious. So there's no risk for the workplace and there's no contact tracing to do at the workplace because he wasn't there. That's what we want to happen in theory, if we know you're a high risk contact. Um, the son has already had the infection. He was the first sick person in the house. So he does not have to extend his isolation anymore. He does his initial 10 days and then he can go back to school as long as he's feeling well. Dad has to start his isolation again from his symptom onset date. And all of the other household members who are not symptomatic, so two other people still remaining, also need to restart their isolation when dad became sick. So 10 more days for each of them. If somebody else becomes sick in the household, they would again restart their isolation period from the day they became sick, but that does not affect um, the individuals who are already sick because they're already infected. So they can't be, if they gave them the infection, they can't be infected again from the person they just gave it to. Okay, but the individuals who are not sick, don't have any symptoms, they still need to stay in isolation until, um, until the last person who's sick is done their isolation period. Okay, I know it's a lot. Um, can we just, I just wanna jump in for a second here because there are a couple of questions in the chat that are specific to these scenarios that you've just gone through. So sure. instead of saving it for later, uh, one of them uh, questions says in scenario number one, 
and actually both of these questions are about scenario number one. Uh, would Sally's daughter isolation period also extend? Um, so no. So the symptomatic person does not extend their isolation period if somebody else is already is, is sick in the household because they were the source of the illness. So I think of it like one one like one time incident. So somebody has to bring the illness into the house. So they're the initial case, and then they're spreading it to everybody else who lives in that household. So this person who had it to start with, they can't get it again because they brought the infection in. So they don't have to isolate any longer. That's not to say they can't get it again in the future from another exposure, but this, this one point in time where everybody's isolating together, it's an isolated incident. So if, they, if they've had it that time, then they don't have to extend. Okay, and then the second question in the Q&A is also about scenario number one. What if Sally has taken a PCR and is negative the morning she calls in? Um, so if she has access to testing, then she still has to isolate with her household. So anytime that a household member is sick, the whole household needs to isolate for the isolation period, even if they test negative. Okay, and there was another question that's sort of related as well. Um, it says, you know, is the day zero uh, the onset of symptoms or is that day one? Uh, so day zero is the day the symptoms started. So if I started symptoms on Monday, then day one would be Tuesday and you would do five days starting on Tuesday. Um, okay, there's another uh, another one that's come in under the Q&A about the scenario, uh, uh, the one about the partially vaccinated family. Oh, so I think this is related to just a, a separate question. So I think that's all the questions in the Q&A that are directly linked to the scenarios you've posted. So we'll let you continue with your presentation at this time. Thank you. Okay, so this is, uh, I think, the last one, but just we realize these isolation periods are extensive and they can repeat, unfortunately, several times, um, which is a limitation of the, the limited access to testing right now. So there are financial assistance available for staff members who are in these situations. Um, the biggest one, I guess, is the three paid sick days that the government has extended now up till July 31st. Um, those three sick days are paid by the employer, and then the employer applies to the government to get reimbursement for that staff's sick time. Um, so that's in place right now. We realize, like, again, the three days doesn't cover the full isolation period. So a couple other programs that are out there is just Ontario Emergency Assistance. This is an Ontario Works program. Um, people can apply for short-term financial assistance. And then there's a couple federal government COVID-19 programs as well. Um, mainly depends on what your situation is. So if you're a caregiver, let's say for a child who is sick, there's um, a caregiver benefit for that if you have to miss work to stay home with your child who's isolating. Um, or if you're sick yourself, there's a sickness recovery benefit. And then there's also a worker lockdown benefit if you're specific workplace is closed because of a lockdown situation. So there are a couple options. I know they're not the fix all for everything, um, but those are the ones we are aware of. All right, we can move on to the Q and A section. So we do have a lot of questions here and um, I guess what I'm gonna suggest is that we might even send them to you um in word format as well so that if you want to you can maybe expand on those but maybe we could hit a couple of them right now um jim i think there's some really um keen um areas there's some there's some questions that are all around rapid testing and testing so maybe we can start with those ones and leslie and i and chris can help with those as well and then we can go on to other areas i think if we deal with them by topic it might make it a little easier Okay, go ahead. 
Yeah, so the one of them um, uh, was, so it asked, so just to be clear, if an employee tests positive in the workplace, we need to report that. And does it get reported to the health unit or WSIB? Or the Ministry of Labor. Yeah, uh, currently you do not need to report that to the health unit unless you're a high risk setting. Okay, so hospitals, long-term care homes, retirement homes, the reporting requirement remains, but for the general workplaces, um, it is not a requirement because the contact tracing now is being done by the workplace. And uh, any the legal requirements for reporting are to the close contacts. So the employer reports um, uh, or you know the, either the case and or the employer as the proxy for the, the case is uh, notifying the high-risk contacts of their exposure. So then the high-risk contact, whoever that may be, patron, a delivery driver, or a, another coworker, um, would be following the guidance that uh, Jillian just walked us through with those flow charts um, as to whether or not they need to isolate uh, at home with uh, alone or with their families as the case may be or uh, if they're able to come back to work and, and self-monitor. So it's, it's about being aware of uh, your exposure so you can take appropriate steps to protect yourself, your family, and the community um, in addition to the workplace. Okay, and there's another question asks, um, if an employee takes a rapid test at home and it, and it is negative, can we still ask them to come in and take our own test to ensure it was their, you know, it was their test and it was accurate before they can come back to the workplace. Um, so if that's part of like a screening program, yes, you can, but if they've had um, a high risk exposure or they're testing because they have symptoms, then one negative rapid antigen test would not, um, would not clear them to return to work. So. The guidance on that right now is two rapid antigen tests, and they need to be taken at least 24 hours apart. And that would determine that you're less likely to have a COVID-19 infection. But in that situation, you would still be required to self-isolate until your symptoms are 24 hours improving. So even though you maybe don't have COVID-19, you still have something else and we don't want you to spread that either. So you still need to stay home till you're feeling better, even if that rapid test is negative. But in terms of an employer wanting verification of using their own, uh, that's at your discretion. If the person's been told to isolate or has to isolate because they have symptoms, then no, they can't leave their property to come in and take your test. But if they're just somebody taking it because they want to screen themselves, and you want them to use yours and you have enough supply, sure. Okay, and I think you just answered this one, but sometimes they get worded a little differently, so it's hard to tell. And I know there's a lot of nuance in the wording with you guys and, and how you interpret it. So uh, this question says, you know, how many rapid tests should be taken and how far apart should they be spaced after a known exposure? Um, yeah, so you should take one as soon as you're aware of your exposure, and then another one 24 to 48 hours uh, after the first test to determine if you've, um, you have a COVID-19 infection. Okay. I think that's all the questions that were in there about rapid tests, so I'll throw it back to one of the other panelists and see if they want to uh, tackle uh, the next section. So I don't know, Leslie, do you want to grab one of these questions or do you want to just start from the beginning? The very first one. Yeah, sure, I can do that. Uh, the first question uh, is wondering if any more information has been provided as to when personal care services that require a guest to remove their mask can resume. And I know later down there was another question about uh, removing masks. I'm just going to try to find it while you answer that one. Yeah, at this point, um, we're still waiting for the next version of the, the regulation to be posted. Uh, we don't know um, uh, whether or not uh, personal care services 
uh, whether the removal of masks will be allowed come Monday or not. So stay tuned. Um, the regulation hopefully will come out today and um, we'll all be able to digest that before Monday. Yes, and I, I can add to that. I concur with, um, with Teresa that we haven't seen the regulation, so we can't 100% say whether that's the case, but it's looking uh, positive. Um, from my reading of the amending regulation, I don't see anything in there that um, would carry on the, um, the restriction on, on beer trims and all that um, uh, type of uh, service, but we can't say 100% yet. So check back with us. So I don't have to cancel my facial appointment for next week, right? <laughs> Things are looking good, but we can't say for sure. <laughs> Chris, do you want to do the next one? I, I'm also noting that we are a couple minutes after 11. Um, so uh, Jill, Suzanne, um, I'm not sure, I know you had mentioned about recording these questions and getting typewritten answers in response. I'm not sure uh, when you want to limit that. I suppose it really depends on our public health um, officials. If I mean, this has become such a, a big issue for so many employers. If, if they're able to stay for uh, a little bit longer, I think we should keep going. But it really depends on people's busy schedules. I know it's a, it's a very uh, busy time for them all. OK, I, I think we can stay a little bit longer, maybe another 15 minutes, I think, uh, is doable. Great. Take it away, Chris. Thank you. Uh, this is the question that came in at uh, 1016 today. I don't think we've done this one yet. It says, we have a screening tool done online daily by our employees. Since the change is December 30th, there doesn't seem to be a PDF available to employers providing a written screening document for revision 5.5. The COVID self-assessment seems to be the only tool. We want to do an in-house system when wondering if there's something else available. There is. Um... If you go back to the slide for uh, PowerPoint, yeah, we're not sharing anymore, but um, if the PowerPoint will be posted or we can send it after the fact, there is a, uh, a, a PDF that still outlines all of the screening questions that are needed and that you can take and adapt into your own version if you wish, or you can continue to use the online screening tool. Um, it, it's your preference. We, we don't mandate you have to use online or paper. Uh, as long as it's getting done, uh, that's really all that matters. Uh, yeah, it is. It's on the, um, there, I included a link. It's uh, on the Ontario website. So I can get you to that specific page. And there's a hyperlink. So if you're looking at, it's either the active or passive screening tool. It's uh, the hyperlink for the passive screening in that table. Slide number, I can tell you. Um, and it is posted. There's a link in the chat to that. So yeah. It's there. So that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Slide seven, the hyperlink for passive screening of patrons will take you to that. Okay. Let me, I'll do one more. It says, uh, with respect to collecting health information for employees, are we allowed to ask if they are vaccinated? Yes, you are. Um, the Ontario Human Rights Commission also uh, back in September put out a position statement um, saying that uh, vaccination policies generally are, are acceptable. Um, and, you know, considering the fact that we are still in a provincial emergency, um, you know, maybe they won't, you know, that opportunity won't be here to stay forever, but um, the policy statement um, uh, does suggest consideration for accommodation uh, to the extent that's not going to be a barrier to your, your business. Um, and it, personal preferences, singular beliefs really are not protected. So there's not necessarily a right to accommodation under the code right now. Um, so they generally are permissible. So uh, you, you do have the right as an employer to have a create a policy and um, further than that, from the purpose of uh, screening, it's, it's a requirement you have to ask in order to know uh, if an employer didn't want to divulge that, you, you might not really have a choice but to extend their self-isolation for 10 days rather than the five, right? So um, 
so the answer in, in short is, is yes, you can ask for that. So you're, you're allowed to ask and are, is the employee obligated to tell you if they don't uh, you assume that they're not vaccinated? Is that what I heard? Yeah, I, I think that if, if they're not willing to, you, you know, really ideally as an employer, you're gonna have a policy that stipulates there, you're, you know, you're asking for this um, as part of your employment and it's a requirement for contact tracing. And so um, the requirement in order to be uh, self-isolating appropriately or making appropriate decisions, you, you need that information. So without it, um, I, I think uh, the general guidance would be to you know, take the more protective approach. And if somebody is sick and they're not willing to, to share that vaccination status with you, the assumption that they're not maybe the, the, where you should be. I don't know, Roberto or Andrew, if you have further thought on that, but um, you know, it, it's a, it is right now under a provincial emergency and for the purpose of uh, workplace contact tracing and identification of high-risk contacts, you need that information as an employer. And uh, there is legal foundation stating that you have a right to ask for it right now. Yeah, I would add to that, that you, know, you, you can't really force someone to tell you what their vaccination status is. The policy, however, is, uh, is, is legal. Uh, if applied in a, um, in a manner which does not offend the human rights code, and uh, just like my workplace here, I provide a proof of um, vaccination for all my uh, jabs. Uh, but if I refused, to, if I had refused to do so, then I would be in non-compliance with the company policy, and then I would be opening myself up as an employee uh, to the ramifications of that. Just as a, as someone who comes in tardy or steals from the workplace, um, so that's where the um, where that uh, stands legally. Uh, the policies at one time, um, I think back to the fall, we had um, uh, differing legal opinions and a lot of it hinged on the human rights tribunal uh, position on it. And as Teresa uh, just mentioned, uh, they've come up with that. So generally speaking, they are uh, legal policies provided they're applied in a fair and um, non-discriminatory manner. Um, I did miss a couple of questions about uh, rapid tests because there was a few in there. So maybe I'll just quickly get try and get these ones in. Uh, one was just asking about if an employee continues to, to test positive after five days, assuming they are fully back, vaccinated, uh, but their symptoms have improved, um, but they continue but they continue to test positive. Um, is the direction to have them remain in isolation until they test negative, or are they able to come back to work? No, so with the rapid antigen testing, the recommendation right now is that if you test positive on a rapid antigen test, you do not resume rapid antigen testing for up 30 days. So it's a month. And so that person, once they've had their confirmed positive test, they shouldn't resume asymptomatic testing again for 30 days. Okay. That's, that's news we're waiting for actually from the ministry as well. So, cause it used to be 90. So it's interesting to see that that's reverted to 30. Yeah, that's it's, it's still 90 for PCR testing. Gotcha. Okay, very good. So that's good. So if you've had a, a positive uh, test and you've done your five days and you're a fully vaccinated person, you can come back to work. You don't need to have get a negative rapid test in order to come back to work. Okay, that's really great for employers to know that. And the second question is kind of a very similar one. Uh, rapid tests are coming back negative, um, even though um, the person is sure that they're positive. Um, is this because the levels are too, uh, too low to read? Um, you know, should they trust that negative, even though the person's pretty sure they, they have been exposed to COVID? Um, no, I mean, it's hard to answer that question. It's really dependent on the situation, but if they've had a high risk exposure, and if they're not vaccinated and they have symptoms, they should isolate um, unless they're, it would be different if they did not have an exposure and they're like, I don't think I was exposed to COVID, but if they know they were exposed to COVID, then they should still isolate. Thank you. Jill, is there any in there that you would like to try and get in before we run out of time? I think there's a, 
so I, this might be related to, I think the difference here between the vaccination and the non-vaccinated. So the contagious period lasts 10 days after a person tests positive. How can they return to work and expose others after five days? But I think the difference based on the scenarios of, as you've described them would mean if you are fully vaccinated after five days, you're no longer considered contagious as long as your symptoms have resolved within the 24 hours. But if you are not vaccinated, then you isolate for the 10 days. Is that is it about contagion or is it about your likelihood to develop symptoms after the five days? Um, so, yeah, so you're right. So the difference between vaccinated and unvaccinated is that when you're vaccinated, you've had exposure to a part of the virus or something that looks like the virus. So your body already has immunity to what it's exposed to. So that immunity can fight off the virus a lot quicker because it's already there. It already remembers, oh, I've seen this before, so I know what to do. Um, whereas people who are not vaccinated don't have that protection because they haven't been exposed to it. So they're going to take longer to fight for their body to fight it off. So they're going to be infectious for a longer period of time. So that's the difference. So if somebody's vaccinated, and they've recovered, they, sh they should be recovered within five days. That's why they shortened that time period because we were seeing people recovering a lot quicker once they were vaccinated. Um, so yeah, they should be fine to return to work. But the other thing with that is that there is guidance that says for the remaining five days that they do avoid attending any high risk settings. So don't visit grandma at the long-term care home until you're at your 10 days um, and make sure that you wear your mask really well, which you should be anyway. Um, wash your hands, just be a little extra cautious with keeping distance from others until you are at your 10 full days. Now, there's another one, which I think with all the kids back in school is probably a really timely one, especially uh, for, for uh, it's putting whole families um, out. The scenario is that there's a partially vaccinated family. The mom, the employee is fully vaccinated. The three-year-old daughter obviously is not and has two or more symptoms. For how long does the mom have to isolate? So mom has to isolate 10 days with the daughter. Wait, well, like it depends on the age of the child. Mm -hmm. So three. if the daughter, sorry? The child is three. Oh, three. Okay, so because they're under 12, and they're especially at three they're not eligible for vaccination and even the kids that are under 12 that are now eligible don't have their full doses yet so their guidance is also five days so there is an exception for children under the age of 12 who have symptoms they isolate for five days so mom as the employee would also isolate for five days in the house with the daughter And I think, Joe, we're probably out of time. So I, I don't know if you want to just uh, make sure, let everybody know that the questions that didn't get answered, we're going to send, um, we'll forward them to the health unit. And they've been great in the past uh, answering them for us. And then we share them out with everybody. Yep, I've grabbed them all from the chat and I've got them in a Word document. So I'll forward them over to you guys and then we will post the answers. And then maybe what we'll do is we'll even wait till Monday because if you get any more indication about what some of those answers might be and you know additional changes confirming that I can have my facial next Saturday, because you know, that's important. <laughs> um, yeah, so does that work for everyone? Yeah. yeah, that would be great. Okay, thank you guys so much for coming and joining us today. Chris, thanks for getting this kind of kicked off. And I know that uh, this is the first time you know, you've, in, you've joined us at this, at this particular table. And uh, Suzanne and Leslie, thanks for sharing this with your members as well. And Andrew, great to see you there, Morgan Scott. <laughs> I know. I feel bad stealing a name and all. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, good. Thanks, everyone. And we'll have the recording posted as quickly as we can. Thanks, everyone. Thank Bye. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Great job, Jillian. Teresa.